You're watching The Business of the Law, the only web TV program focusing on the challenges and opportunities facing the legal profession. I'm Eric Press from Bernero and Press, in for Lee Pacquia today. We're joined in the studio now by Roger Meltzer, the chair of DLA Piper. Welcome, Roger. Good to see you. Eric, right, how are you? Good. Um, 250 lawyers get added this month to DLA in Canada. What do you need them for? Well, we've always believed that the overall North American strategy for a global firm had to include, had to include Canada. The problem with Canada is that given the land size, the population, and the massive number of lawyers, you had to really find the right fit. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit more difficult to find the right fit in the major money centers because they rely so heavily on the referral base coming from the lower 48. And they also believe that change is never going to reach them. Um, after we had the experience with the Heenan uh, liquidation, where we almost did a greenfield, um, I decided that we really needed to look elsewhere and change our strategy and our vision and look west and look for things that were really important to us as opposed to what was important to the Canadian the Canadian legal market, namely the Canadian money centers. And what was important to us was energy, um, both oil and gas, mining, forestry, in those sectors, how we could do those in capital markets, and at the same time providing a window to Asia where we have almost 250 lawyers that no other place in Canada can do as well as Vancouver. So we began the search with the Davis firm. We found them to be remarkably similar to us in the sense that they were a roll-up of regional firms when the provincial laws changed. And for the most part, I think law firm mergers fail because the leadership can't get along. And they try really hard to get along, but they don't really manage to get along. From the very beginning, we found ourselves completely in alignment with the Davis leadership. So now we have 250 lawyers in Canada spread throughout Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Montreal, Whitehorse, Yellowknife. We now have the distinction of actually being the law firm with an office furthest north than any other law firm in the world. You may be the only Global 100 uh, law firm that has an office in Whitehorse. Exactly. Um, and uh, we hope that the uh, merger will be completed on the 17th of April. Right. Uh, they're not particularly big in Toronto. Are you going to just ignore Toronto? No. I mean, from the very beginning, we understood that Toronto was something that needed to be uh, upcharged. Uh, we uh, discussed that as a strategy from the very beginning with the Davis leadership. Uh, we felt that we could help them in, in the same way that we have been able at DLA to recruit successfully in major money centers in the States. I can tell you that uh, once the merger was announced, I have probably 30 or so resumes on my desk from Toronto, very prominent lawyers from very prominent Toronto firms that realize aspirationally that they're not going to get to a global firm if they stay with their firms of origin. Good. Well, we'll keep watching what, what, what DLA will do in, in Canada and, and, and Toronto. Good, good luck with that. Now, now, last year was interesting, according to the reports we've seen. Uh, headcount was down mm -hmm. at DLA overall by about 7%. Mm -hmm. do you, do you, is the pairing over, or do you think that more is to come? Uh, I think you look at it every year. Um, I am not a believer, um, although I would say that maybe I'm in the minority, that 2015 is necessarily going to be as good a year as 2014. Mm. I think when you look at things like monetary crises, 
the geopolitical situation, uh, wide volatility in capital markets. It's not completely clear that the kind of stability that the law business enjoyed during 2014 is going to go through 2015. I also think that as you get further and further into the evolution of a firm like DLA, which is going to celebrate its 10th anniversary this year, you have a better sense of what is needed in the various practice areas. And the reshaping of the firm in all areas um, is something that if you're running an operation that's two and a half billion dollars in revenue is part of the day-to-day -day work of a chairman or a CEO. So perhaps some more pairing. Perhaps some more pairing. What do you make of the latest combination in China? Well, I've said publicly, um, uh, and, and that's not taking into consideration Kingwood, Mallison's, S.J. Berwin. Right. I've said publicly that I applaud the fact that they were the first movers in this. Um, I wonder, in my own mind, whether they really understand what's ahead of them, the depth of what's going to be required to integrate a firm of this magnitude and size. And... The best thing for those of us who are watchers, even though they were first movers, is that it gives you a real sense of what the Chinese regulatory authorities are thinking. Mm -hmm. So while they may not have said, we approve of this merger, what they may be saying is, we think it's a good idea for Chinese law firms that are indigenous to have more of a global reach. That's a very, very attractive potential for a, global, a firm that aspires to be a global elite law firm. Um, not to mention the fact that it's only a question of time as to when the Chinese economy becomes so large that you can't, one can't look at it and say, well, gee whiz, I'm not going to focus on this as a potential area for growth. So. I applaud it. Um, I think uh, that it's going to be tough sledding for quite a long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the Denton's folks have certainly gone a long way in doing a lot of mergers. I mean, they announced a merger with an Atlanta firm almost three week, less than three weeks after they announced Denton's, uh, announced Ching. But, but from my point of view, uh, this is really materially different on a cultural basis. And, and there are reports that have been widely circulated that the mergers that went on with Kingwood Mallison's uh, within the re Asia Pacific region was pretty tough sledding in and of itself. Mm -hmm. That's not taking into consideration a UK, although they've now done Berwyn's, that's not taking into consideration a U.S. firm or a large U.S. firm mm -hmm. with a Chinese firm. Mm -hmm. I mean, given your reach and ambition at DLA, is it something uh, that, that you would consider? Hooking up with a Chinese, a gargantuan Chinese firm? Well, you know me pretty well. Gargantuan is not necessary. Gargantuan may be what some people say about DLA. Um, I think one has to look at all of these opportunities um, as a, on a size and scope basis. It can't be large for large sake. It has to fit within your profile and within your vision. I think it unlikely uh, that we would not consider looking very seriously at it were the right Chinese law firm to be interested, interested in our vision, interested in the kind of integration that it takes to have a global firm. You can't run it as a joint venture. Mm -hmm. You have to really spend the time to believe that you can integrate the two cultures, and that's tough and demanding work.
It is. I mean, it's difficult enough to blend a firm that uh, two firms, one in New York and one in Boston, one in Silicon Valley, one in San Francisco. Right. What they're talking about here is formidable. Well, and that's really the question, I think, to watch from a someone like you who's watched the legal market for a long mm -hmm. time. Are they going to do more than be a joint venture? Mm -hmm. And you as a, as a watcher and a critic, a constructive critic, I'll say, Thank you. Of, the, of the law firm business will reach your own conclusions after a reasonable period of time as they ramp it up.